So I'd like to invite our panelists now and introduce them to you. We have with us uh, Professor Alison Littlejohn from the University College Knowledge Lab. And Alison's work concentrates on professional um, training and, and learning. And that's usually within a global context. So that will be a very interesting perspective for us. Matt from Australia, he's a natural assessment specialist. So um, we're looking forward to hearing what Matt has to say. And we've got Marco Kaltz with us um, from Heidelberg. And Marco, uh, among his many interests, is formative assessment and assessment for learning. And we've also got Taja with us. Taja uh, from uh, Uvascula, her work is very related to inclusive higher education, a perspective we really need in this discussion. And she's also a specialist in e-assessment, looking at proctoring systems that she took part in a big European project. So thank you, Taja. So I'm going to ask the participants a number of questions, and I'm sure they will build upon each other's answers. And let's make a start now. I'm going to start with Alison. And for all of you, you know, what was your university's approach, you know, to summative assessment? And now that you've, um, you know, we've been through some of this, you know, what were the pros and cons? What have we learned, you know, in our areas? So over to you, Alison. Welcome. Thank you, Denise, and, and thank you so much for the invitation to this panel. It's in such a, a relevant and topical, timely topic. So, um, looking forward to discussing these issues. So, uh, my I'm from University College London in the UK, and in March 2020, like many universities around the world, in line with um, the government guidance, our campus uh, went into a lockdown and that's when we really had to change the assessment. Uh, now, to give you an idea about UCL and its scope and scale, uh, there's about uh, 44,000 students and, and many of those students are international and we advise them to go to wherever their uh, place of resi main residence was. Uh, there is around 8,000 academics spread over 11 faculties, so a lot of different topics, um, disciplines and, and ways of examining. Um, so I, I would describe how we changed as, as being an evolving approach where we did some test and learn, although it wasn't always um, well structured and it was a little bit ad hoc because it had to happen so quickly. But in 1920 academic year, so around about March 2020, all exams and assessments uh, were changed to online capstone. So in first year, for example, um, there was a high stakes uh, exam which was going to be online for, for first years. And usually those were over 24 hours and could be book exams. Now, we have a variety of different approaches to assessment, but in general, a lot of the exams would have been a three-hour exam in a, a lecture hall uh, where we had invigilators watching over. So that was quite different. Uh, we implemented a no detriment policy to make sure that there was no discrimination depending on the circumstances of the students. Actually, we didn't have to use that policy and it had some consequences um, in later years. The students could self certify if they had extenuating circumstances that could affect their exams. And I think that was in line with many universities across the UK. So, as I said, an evolving approach. So, in the next academic year, 2021, the academic year that's just ended, uh, what we discovered was that um, we benefited from purchasing a platform which was Uniwise. Now, this is a Danish-based company that we've been working with, uh, and that meant that um, the online exams could be managed centrally and most of the exams were 24 hour, but some went back to being timed exams. Uh, 
we discovered that because we had put in so many clauses in the previous year that there had been some grade inflation. And it was very difficult to then go back and say, well, we, we don't want these clauses in place because obviously the students themselves felt um, that these uh, different checks should, should still be in place. So this year we've learned from all of that and uh, we now have a, a new team of digital assessment advisors across all faculties. And this is to encourage more online assessment as we go forwards and as we move out of the pandemic. So we're encouraging people to use the UniWise platform so that there is some central management um, and also support for colleagues. And most centrally managed exams will be online this year with timed windows. So as I said, going back to what, what were the problems where we overcompensated in, in the first year, we, we wanted to make sure that everything was as fair as it, it could be, but that did lead to some grade inflation. But what were the benefits? Well, it was like a massive leap forward in terms of thinking differently about how we could use technologies. So that's what happened at UCL. Thank you, Alison. I'm now going to hand over to Marco. Let's hear what was happening in Heidelberg. Thank you, Denise, and also thank you, Eden, for organizing uh, this webinar on a very timely topic. So I think in the uh, panel here, I'm representing a very small higher education institution, uh, the Heidelberg University of Education, with approximately 5,000 students and 300 academics. And um, the, the, the uh, development was, of course, the same, like Alison reported, with an ad hoc need to completely redesign our services and also examination and assessment approach. Uh, and what I remember from it is that the first thing we did was we changed and relaxed the examination policies in the first place to get stress out of the system, more or less, uh, to be sure that neither lecturers nor students uh, are, are in any case frightened to do exams in a different way. And we, we built in a lot of flexibility and repetition options for different kinds of exams. I think this was one of the first activities that we did. At the same time, of course, we needed to do that to change also the practices for the examination to adhere to the new uh, reality and to allow, for example, online examinations, which was not foreseen in many study programs. So that was more the, the policy-based approach. Like I said, we are a smaller higher education institution. Uh, our whole infrastructure is running on open source uh, software. Uh, without any external service providers. So we set up also in a very short amount of time a pilot study um, to find out what kind of assessments we can realize in which systems. Uh, in the end, we implemented uh, the most of the assessment in, um, in Lime survey, in Moodle, and in uh, Sochi survey is also a survey system. And what we saw in practice, what has been implemented was a mix of open books, book exams uh, together with time-based testing. Uh, so mostly multiple choice, but uh, in, a, in a very short amount of time. Um, and from what we've learned, I think in general, this approach has worked quite well. We also had to work on usability issues for students with disabilities because not all of these systems were uh, by default um, following rules that also students with different types of disabilities uh, could be using them. And um, what one problem that has uh, not really solved is everything related to authentication, of course, um, because that is still for me a very complex issue. Um, if you have only remote exams, um, yeah, how can you be sure that the person that is doing the exams is the person and so on and so on. Um, the open book exams were mostly focused on more complex problems 
and procedural knowledge, um, which I think was, was also interesting because some exams were transferred to more knowledge testing to uh, more complex problems, which uh, was difficult in a short amount of time to do, but on the other hand, a very interesting move. Um, the time-based testing were mostly uh, really multiple choice questions with knowledge, knowledge testing. Um, and some of the um, assessment practices just use so many items that you didn't more or less even have time to think about uh, cheating in such a, such a stress framework. Um, we also, of course, had an evolving cyclic approach to development. Uh, we also had to see if our infrastructure can take so many users at the same time because our institution is a presence institution and we're using normally these services just accompanying to our teaching presence in the institution. Uh, but that, that has also uh, worked quite well. We looked into proc proctoring solutions at some moment in time, um, but nobody was really interested to, um, to go into that solution. Uh, also because we had the feeling that besides the authentication problem, most of the uh, assessment practices could be done in the systems we've set up. Uh, making a jump into now, um, we are now tomorrow, uh, no, today actually we started again some, some presence teaching, uh, but we're still using a lot of online systems. And I would expect that some of the assessment practices are also still existing when we're going fully back to the campus. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Alison, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Perhaps you could answer them. One of them was, what do you mean by grade inflation? And the other one was, um, what company were you using, Uniwise, wasn't it? But could you give some details? Yes, uh, in reverse order, the company's called Uniwise. You can you can find out about them online, just, just search for them. By grade inflation, what I mean is that um, well, the, the whole system changed overnight. And so colleagues were left in terms of, of thinking about how they assess. So I think that uh, colleagues uh, basically would err on the, on, on the side of being as fair to students as, as possible. And that maybe meant that um, how they assess the final grade, if it wasn't a number, if it was... Um, you know, an A or a B or a pass or or fail um, would generally uh, be fairer and more open than than it might had have been in previous years. Of course, um, we look at the data. It was very different exam conditions, so we have to be careful in in terms of how we. Um, in, ter in terms of how we interpret that. But uh, these were for first years who were going into second year. And I think colleagues wanted to make sure that all of these students had a fair chance. Thank you, Alison. And uh, we'll now move to Tarja and let let's find out what was happening in vascular. Good afternoon, everybody. Maybe I started with a couple of words about our university. So I come from the University of Uvascular. Uh, and it's a quite a traditional university, meaning that students mainly come to the campus. As a part of the traditional university, we have an open university which offers studies mainly online, and those studies are open for all, no matter what their educational background is. Uh, at the open university, meaning online, we do not offer or produce or, or give uh, degrees but parts of the decrease. But with the Open University Studies, our students can complete their degree in faculties. It's a kind of special system in the world, I guess. Um, and in Finland, uh, higher education institutions and teachers have a quite a big autonomy in terms of assessment, especially when compared to many other European countries. And there are not too many regulations at the national level and only few in institutional level. 
of course, we have curricula to follow. Uh, during the pandemic and lockdown, uh, our strategy was to offer some options for staff or and teachers, and and it was strongly the choices were strongly based on choices of individual staff members or teams working and and teaching together. So I guess the most common choice was to add the flexibility of studies by using formative assessment instead of summative assessment. So very quickly, uh, teaching staff had to change assessment mode and, and uh, the pedagogy of the courses. And then secondly, uh, we have an exam system for students to take exam almost whenever they like. It's organized by consortium of 27 higher education institutions. Uh, and uh, institutions have so-called exam rooms in campus. So in, in I am not sure, but I think uh, there are those kind of rooms in all the higher education institutions who participate in this consortium. So it means that students, for example, in our from our institution can go to the University of Helsinki to have exam and, and things like that. So, so it's something. But during the total lockdown, those rooms were closed. Nowadays, students can use them with some restrictions. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Then the, the third option was uh, to have a scheduled kind of open book exams in Moodle. So it's something same you already heard about from other institutions. So, so um, it's, uh, it's uh, in open university is the, the, should I say, basic way to study and, and have formative uh, assessment. So it, it was something not so new, but it was, um, we didn't have any proctoring system integrated to our model. We tried to use also, or we tried uh, Zoom exams, but we uh, quite suddenly we got feedback or not actually our university, but other universities in Finland that there are some challenges with the GDP error are when, when using Zoom as a, as a ex, for the exams. So, and, and then we have exams in Moodle with the proctoring, uh, but that wasn't very often used option, partly because we have or had very limited number of licenses. The system was integrated to the Moodle and, and um, as far as I know, the costs were remarkable and it didn't work very, very well, or they had a lot of challenges with it. So, yeah, but nowadays, uh, like like Dennis already mentioned, I participated in, in a European project called Tesla project. I, I think some of you are familiar with that, that system. And now we, we uh, have acquired Tesla system to our university, and we are looking forward to see what kind of possibilities we can offer with it, especially when traditional face-to-face -face exams are not an option and, and summative assessment is needed. Yeah, we are lucky to have many solutions and options available, and we are lucky to have a flexibility in our institution. So I, I have a feeling that we did it quite well so far. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Taja. There's a question for you. Okay. A floor. Um, when you said students can take exams whenever they want. Yeah. It what means, does that mean? <laughs> yeah. It means that we have a kind of room. So it's a place where students can take exams written at the computer at time suitable for them. So the process requires that the examiner has created the exam and questions in the electronic exam system. The exam situations are automatically recorded for exam supervision. And the exam rooms adds the flexibility of studies, um, uh, not, not whenever, so they have to travel to campus. But now we are working and developing the so-called 
I don't know how to translate it, but kind of uh, students can use their own laptops and, and uh, they they can take an exam with their own laptop at home or or in our um, exam rooms in campus. So so the flexibility comes from that they can they can just the how you say uh, schedule the the individual exam time. So that that how it goes. Thank you. And last but not least, here's Matt to tell us what's been going on down under. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Matthew. I'm from Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm currently working at Macquarie University, which is a mid-sized university of about 40,000 students in um, the northwestern suburbs of Sydney. Uh, I don't live in the northwest, but that's another thing. Um, the um, pandemic, I guess the, the shutdown, the lockdown hit um, our session in, it was our first se uh, session number one in 2020. Um, we were halfway through, so there wasn't really any time to plan anything. Um, so essentially the solution was we stuck everything in our VLE, our Moodle, Moodle system. Um, all the exams were digitized in the sense they were either quizzes or they were Word documents. Um, and in some cases, the students would handwrite their math problems and then take a photo of it and then upload it to the Moodle. Um, they were a mix of, they were mostly 100% online, but it was all no invigilation, no supervision, no proctoring. Um, uh, you know, it was an emergency situation at that time. Um, there was probably around 500 different examinations that happened over the exam period in the first session. Um, and then after the first session happened, um, that was a in when was that June ish in Australia at that time. And then in about July, um, the coronavirus situation in Australia really decreased a lot. Um, so in the second half of 2020 and the first half of 2021, uh, we started coming back to have some on campus teaching again. Um, but a lot of the exams were still done online. So in those two, in the second half of 2020 and the early part of 2021, there was a mix of on-campus exams and a mix of online exams. Um, however, we're also looking forward to thinking about, okay, how can we do online invigilation as well, online proctoring, as they say. Um, we piloted um, some online proctoring service providers. Uh, we found that were not very satisfactory but we also piloted uh, using Zoom as an invigilation technique with uh, staffing, uh, people uh, hired and trained by the university, by our central exams office. So they provided some supervision. Uh, they observed the groups of students through Zoom. Um, that was a really small scale pilot in the second part of 2020. Uh, then in 2021, we increased it a little bit more um, in this case, mostly we were catering to the students who could not attend the on-campus exam. So if, the, if the, the unit coordinator for that subject has said, okay, my examination is going to be on campus, uh, therefore it is a supervised examination. But of course we have students who cannot come because there was travel restrictions and other things that were happening. Um, in those cases, we allocated those students to do a Zoom exam. Um, and then in this current semester we're in now, we're in now in the second part of our academic year. So for the session two in 2021, uh, coming up in early November, we are now have, uh, scheduling about 23,000 sittings um, for uh, online invigilated or online proctored uh, Zoom exams that we will staff ourselves. We also have exams that are non not invigilated or not supervised online exams. And there's a small number of on-campus exams because we're crossing our fingers and hoping we can, we can still do those. But there's also been a strategy by the university to try and diversify away from examinations. So the unseen timed exam to try and get teachers to do other types of assessments um, such as pro mini projects or time limited assignments, I would call them mini projects, 
Um, there's also a very small number of uh, online uh, oral assessments like Viva exams or Viva assessments or interactive assessments, um, again, done through Zoom, but there are a small number at this time. So I think what we're hoping for moving forward is more diversity of final assessments, so more alternative assessments, but also improving our internal capacity to do the Zoom-based examinations as well. So that's, I think, where we're at at my university at this time. Thanks, Matt. And we'll start with you with a second question, which really follows on about online proctoring. Now, what do you know about online proctoring? A lot of this is outsourced to companies. Um, what's your experience and opinion about this sort of uh, way of uh, working going forward? Yeah, so as, as I did mention, we did pilot two different methods of online uh, proctoring. Let's just call it proctoring because I know that's a familiar word to many people. Uh, in Australia, we tend to call it exam supervision or exam invigilation, but I'll use the word proctoring. Um, so we piloted one company who's well known in the industry, which will remain nameless, um, that provided live humans um, and another one that provided an automated uh, uh, approach where there wasn't a, a live human, but it was just face tracking and screen recording. Um, our pilots found that they were unsatisfactory, I might say. Let's just say they were quite unsatisfactory. Um, we found that things like technical issues were difficult to solve. When things went wrong, it tended to result in the exam session being abandoned or failed for that student. Um, and it was really quite difficult to figure out what went wrong so that we could then fix the problem. Um, so that was an issue. The service providers would allocate a person on the fly. Um, so we couldn't train those people. We couldn't talk to those people to discuss what kind of examinations we want. We had to write the specification down and we found that was a very imprecise and messy process. Um, they weren't plugged into our problem-solving IT support, student support, um, counselling services, etc., that we make available to students during the exam periods, so and none of that was connected or joined up. Um, I would say that those kinds of online remote proctoring companies, three types of torture for students is what I referred to them as um, in my report. I said three types of torture. Let's not do that again. However, what we did find, though, is a sort of a kinder method of doing it with Zoom because we employed the people to do it ourselves. Um, they were trained by us, our, you know, our, our central exams office, who were very good at this process. You know, they were good at running examinations and they then upskilled themselves in the technology. Um, and I think that was a, an, a good uh, solution for us at that time. Um, now, I'm not saying that proctoring services can't work in certain circumstances. There are universities that do use them and seem to be happy with them, um, but it certainly did not work for us. Um, and it didn't work for the flexibility that we wanted. So the proctoring company we tried, they wanted everything to be a Moodle quiz and nothing else whereas we wanted different kinds of examinations to happen. So pen on paper exam, a Word document exam, a quiz exam, and a mix of those things. Um, sometimes we wanted the students to use a spreadsheet application, for example, to solve a problem. Um, we wanted students to be able to draw diagrams and then upload the diagrams. They wouldn't allow that. So, but within our in-house method, when we staffed it, we set the rules and it seemed to work quite flexibly for that point of view. So I guess my, 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 my sort of telltale thing is if you want it done properly, do it yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Over to you, Taja. Anything to add to that? You're muted, Taja. Sorry. <laughs> okay. When we are talking about online proctoring, I I guess we can talk about our experience experiences with Tesla, Tesla, uh, and and some of you are probably familiar with that. But if I shortly try to describe, uh, we had a 
uh, European project funded by Horizon 2020, and 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 we we uh, t- uh, developed, or actually we, for example, in our university, we tested the system system that included. Uh, it was it was developed to for the e authentication and and it included the face a students face and voice recognition keystroke dynamics and included plagiarism checker and and forensic analysis was also made uh, about students exams and assessments and uh, and uh, we have a uh, of course it was the project where the system was develop it but it's easy to say that system must be very stable and reliable which that system wasn't in that time when we we piloted with it and and um, um so we also made some research about the 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 experiences of students and teachers and and uh uh and my team, me and my team was, uh, we, our, our team was, uh, we had a focus on usability and accessibility of the system. So it's very, very uh, easy to say that that uh, the system, system we are using or developing uh, have to, sorry, sorry, I have to be accessible because as we know, we have uh, about 10% of our students have some kind of disabilities or some kind of situational situational um, factors infecting, they, they are affecting their learning and, and performance. So uh, what we learned during that uh, Tesla project uh, I would like to underline that we we uh, need the systems that diversity of students can use, and we tested the system like with a with a students using some assistive technology, for example, screen readers. And and as somebody already mentioned, uh, they found some accessibility issues with the the online proctoring. So. Yeah, I think that's that's all so far. Thank you, Taja. And uh, over to you, Marco. Yes, um, as reported, uh, since we decided against the implementation of a proctoring system, I have much less practical experience compared to Matt or Taya. Uh, nonetheless, from from first tests of such a system, I was found it pretty appealing that you could integrate a proctoring system with existing learning management systems. So the ease of of use of the system we looked at seemed to be quite high. Um, Nonetheless, I was very surprised by the, uh, yeah, by the discourse about proctoring as a whole during the pandemic, because I think it was a very black and white discussion. It seemed uh, very much focused on like lecturers wouldn't trust their students and um, I th- I don't know, and wouldn't care for students. I don't know. I, th- I thought that's a very biased uh, impression that you got from following the discourse on proctoring, because I see many people taking care for students and needs and special situations. And um, I-, I had the feeling that the proctoring topic was mostly based on this lawsuit uh, happening right now. Uh, and not so much on the potentials of proctoring. And furthermore, I was, like I said already, I was surprised that um, open universities are keeping study centers just for authentication purposes. And uh, proctoring could offer solutions for that without all the uh, other services. Uh, But in fact, many higher education institutions didn't, use any authentication um, methods in this specific time. So I'm, I don't know, I'm, I've, I found proctoring an interesting idea, especially for the purpose for authentication, not so much for screening the room, uh, looking for, for cheating and so on. Uh, and I was surprised that this topic has been 
in some higher education institutions nearly untouched. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. So, Alison. Yes, it, it, very interesting points that have been raised by colleagues. And so, so one thing I'd like to focus on is this change of relationship that, that proctoring brings about. It's not that there, there hasn't been proctoring in the past, um, but that proctoring has generally, um, in traditional exams, been invigilators in the same room, uh, checking the identity of, of students, making sure that they're doing the exam as 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 they usually are. And so what we've moved to is um, a datification of that process. So the change in relationship between universities and students is profound from that perspective. At UCL, we didn't really use proctoring because uh, in the first year we used Moodle as um, the, the platform where we were managing the online exams. But, um, you know, going forward, uh, working with Uniwise, they're looking at different proctoring systems. I, I would say that I'm, I'm heartened by the open response that they're taking. They recognise the difficulties that, that, that there are with uh, some forms of proctoring. Um, I would say that proctoring is not online proctoring is not a completely new phenomenon. I mean, in the gig economy, for example, there are platforms that check every 10 minutes or so whether or not the person that they're paying to do a job is actually doing the job. So they use the camera monitoring every 10 minutes, they check the keystrokes and so on. So there are other industries um, where proctoring um, is is being undertaken, but I guess um, that it does put both academics and students in, I would say, in, in a difficult position where the relationships between them have changed. Thank you, Alison. And I'm going to come back to you now with another set of questions, because we discussed how we had to move online quickly with our teaching. And then, of course, we've got exams. Students need to graduate. How do we check on these exams? But also before the lockdown, we were experienced co in companies, uh, which we often call SA mills, um, that would students could pay to the company for them to write their papers, maybe an open book exam even. And what with the change in circumstances, students not coming to the university, how do we think contract cheating is uh, developing? Um, controversially, I've said, is it going to be the next normal? I think that's a really important question, Denise. So thanks for asking. Um, I, I like to think that the majority of students who come to university are still there to learn. They're there so, so that they can go through a life-changing experience. Um, however, obviously, with different technologies being developed and uh, the number of students being scaled up, there are more opportunities and, and potentially more possibility for some students to um, to you know, pay for SE mills to, to do their assessments for them. So we do have to, to think about ever more sophisticated ways of finding out whether the, the students are, um, are going through assessments as we expect or not. I mean, I actually think it calls for a fundamental change to how we think about exams. If it's possible to pay someone else to complete an assessment for you, then I think we really do have to think about how we assess our students. And unfortunately, uh, finding ways where we can assess at scale, uh, but not allow SE Mills companies to come and, you know, complete an assessment for you is very difficult. So in short, I, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think students are coming to university to learn so I don't think it's going to be the norm, but uh, I'd like to flag that we need to find more sophisticated ways of finding out whether or not there is cheating. I was actually um, in a viva for a PhD 
last year where um, the student had paid someone to to do the work. And for me, as an academic, that was quite shocking. And it was very hard work by the registry team to uh, to take up that complaint, to go through an investigation to prove it, um, and and therefore to fail the student. That that was um, was very shocking. And it's not fair for the students who have actually done their own exams. So I'll let someone else answer this question. It's very important. Thanks, Alison. Marco. I have to admit, I have very little insight and experience with contract cheating. I have never actually faced such a case uh, in my career so far, at least not knowingly. On the other hand, I would concur with Alison that it's also the result of a system that is thinking of um, allowing only students to succeed if we have tested everything that we have thought so before, so I studied still before the Bologna reform in which not, I mean, I could just go to a lecture and uh, I mean, I, I didn't need to be tested for that to get some credit points. So I think, in fact, the more stress we put on exams for the whole system, uh, the more likely it would be that students would need to use these kind of solutions to succeed um, because I mean, the complexity of students' lives is also has also very much increased in terms of, of funding um, their their situation, uh, finding housing uh, in big cities which are very expensive, finding jobs, and so on. So, I think if we talk about contract cheating, we need to look at that more on a systemic level and think about if we don't put students into looking for that solutions by stressing examination for every single module that we are teaching. So sometimes I wish I would could go back with my students to the time before Bologna, where I just could offer them something and they could make use of that. So a little bit more freedom um, and a little bit more, more general approach to knowledge acquisition and learning and not testing everything that we taught them. Thank you, Marco. Taja. Thank you. I don't have too much to add for that, but but I'm also, like Alison said, very optimistic, optimistic with the future. So it's sometimes said that we finish Finland is a trust-based society, and we might sound for it quite naive sometimes because we trust our students so much. But there is also one point that because we are uh, quite a small how you say language group or or there isn't uh, so it it gives a kind of protection for for us because everything is not available for our students they have to use Finnish language so they markets are so much smaller there thanks <laughs> thanks Taja and Matt now because Matt there's been a lot of work going on in um, Australia with Phil's group about um, contract cheating and SNLs. So perhaps you'd like to let us know about that interest and work too. Yeah, so Professor Phil Dawson at Deakin University, um, a former colleague of mine from Weeble and we're both at Monash, um, also has, has done a lot of re research around in digital cheating. He's actually got a book out on um, e-cheating, um, but I also refer to the work of um, the now uh, former uh, professor um, Tracy Breitag, who did a lot of research around contract cheating um, and the factors that, you know, the, the, the call them hygiene factors, if you will, that that um, maybe perhaps lead students down that path, um, the kinds of assessment designs that, that can be more or less cheatable, et cetera. Um, in Australia, I think it is, it is a concern for our system. Um, it, it's been in the media. The government has introduced laws to outlaw commercial cheating service providers. Um, in fact, the, the first one, the, the law is relatively new. Um, the first uh, website was recently just the legislation had been enacted and the, uh, the, the uh, national regulation body for the tertiary education sector has just banned one website so far um, with a list of about 3,000 more websites to be 
uh, is similarly banned on a national basis, but um, I don't think they've heard of VPNs. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, I, yeah, look, I think contract cheating has always been there. Um, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, however, I guess, you know, like e-commerce, like anything has turned a local problem into a global service providing problem, um, you know, so that particularly because English is the medium of instruction for us, uh, it's probably the mo you know, one of the most common languages in higher education. There are many service providers all around the world wanting to sell their services to students. Um, and we have a diversity of students in our system. Um, so I think there are vulnerabilities there. Higher education institutions are aware of them. Um, you know, to tackle this problem, it's a wicked complex problem and you need a wicked complex solution to address it. You can't, there is not, there's no one solution to this problem. A law is not gonna stop it. Online proctoring is not gonna stop it. Um, you know, assessment design changes alone are not going to stop it. You need a holistic approach to addressing this issue. So, you know, student education campaigns, you know, making sure your students have got the skills to succeed, um, providing, you know, health and financial support to support students so they don't make silly decisions, um, as well as, well as, of course, you know, detection and punishment and all of those sorts of things. Um, you need a holistic approach. And I think the university sector in Australia is certainly realising that and they're doing better and better at implementing academic integrity frameworks and policies and support mechanisms to support the students to succeed so that they don't have to make those bad decisions. And when they do, to try and have an educative approach. I think that's, that's the sort of future. I wouldn't say that contract cheating per se is the future. It's like everything we have to adapt and our university systems and our educators and our administrators and support staff have to adapt to support our students. Um, and I think we also try to have the best view with the say that most students don't cheat. It's a minority problem, but we can't be bl naive and blind to it either. So that would be my, my take on it. Thank you, Matt. And I have one last question before we open the floor. And I'd like you to just answer in a couple of sentences very quickly. Um, what do you think is the future of the exam now? So we'll start with Matt and we'll go in reverse. <laughs> okay. What do I think is the future of the exam versus what do I hope is the future of the exam? <laughs> okay. Okay, let me start with what I hope is not the future of exams. I don't want to see massive online multiple choice quizzing systems. I think that would be a mistake. Um, you know, there's that, there's that triad of authenticity, integrity, and scalability. Um, what I've observed is a lot of the commercial service providers have given us scalability, tried to give us integrity, but have forgotten about that authentic assessment side of the equation. What I would like to be able to see is approaches that facilitate authentic, genuine, interesting assessments that the students are more engaged with. That doesn't necessarily mean an exam, but it could be an exam-like experience. Um, so that's what I hope the future of online exams are, much more authentic, richer, diverse forms of assessment that we can have students do. That would be my Thank take much. so far. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So, Tarja. Oh, Let's see how it goes in the future, <laughs> um, because I'm interested in diversity of students and eagle possibilities to study. I hope we could more often look at the assessment from universal design for learning perspective. So, so meaning that there are many ways to show what you have learned. And there are, of course, differences between the discipline, discipline is how to, how to show it. So, I think that in the future, the quite a traditional exam will be one of the many options. So we'll get more solutions, instruments, and tools to implement exams online. The exam itself is not good or bad. How the exam is implemented makes the difference. I think so. Thanks. Thank you. Marco. So I, I have very, very, um, uh, yeah, low wishes for the future, I have to say, because one of the futures of the exam is hope, hopefully without paper. One of the side effects that I have uh, seen at our institution is that 
actually we have uh, exams uh, now in a digital format and that already uh, brings frees up some time for lecturers in the administration of the exams and i hope that that, that this will also stay uh, regarding uh, exam innovation i would wish that we would see much more formative assessment opportunities for students throughout their studies and then a type of more complex authentic problem solving where it doesn't even make sense to cheat or i mean and where you can use all means that you want to use so that would be my ideal future but similar like matt i think this is will be heavily influenced by economic and scalability um, limits to this kind of approaches, especially for individual lecturers. They will not buy in if it will take more time for them. Mm. Yeah, timing and resources, always a problem. Thanks, Marco. And Alison, you've got the last word. Yes, uh, well, I would agree with what, what colleagues have been saying, um, but I think it's particularly important to um, to focus on authenticity because, as Matt said, um, that tends to be the 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 part of the the three things that he emphasised that gets overlooked. And I'll tell you why I think authenticity is really important. Years ago, I did a lot of work with Shell, who measure timed competence for new graduates. So that's the time the new graduate can be in a job and can work competently without uh, a lot of supervision. And that time is getting bigger and bigger, partly because the jobs are becoming more complex, but also because something was happening in university education where students were coming out with even better grades, but were less able to move into a job. Now, I'm not arguing that education is only about... Um, getting a job and about work is much more than that. It's about our whole lives. But the more authentic the assessment, then the more we're focusing on assessment as learning and enabling students to be able to learn through the assessments that they have. Thank you, Alison. We have some questions coming through and I'd like to bring those to the attention of the panel. And then there might be some more questions from the floor. But um, uh, Matt, the question was about what training did you um, give your people when they were going online with exams, online exams? Yeah, so um, I humbly say that I wrote the initial versions of the training materials for our staff and our students. Um, I developed some quite a lot of guides, but I based it on the good work of other institutions, such as University of Melbourne. Um, they'd also started off doing Zoom exams as well. Um, I then passed that to our excellent people in the central exams team, um, who are the real experts, I should say, at doing the exams. So they took my guidance notes, if you will, for how I think the e-exams or the online exams in Zoom can go ahead. And then they conducted training sessions with the staff that they had had uh, hired or allocated to do the online invigilation tasks, and at the same time, in the in the two weeks prior to the exam period, um, we also run uh, zero stakes practice runs for the students, so the students can get familiar with how it all just works. They can come along to a practice session and experience a mock exam in Zoom, so that they know they can test their equipment. They can test their internet, they can test the procedures, they can ask questions, and it also acts as training for our, our new invigilators as well, so they can get some practice in remembering it was really early days for us. So a lot of the people we're having doing this job are doing it for the first time. So the training sessions for the students are also the training sessions for the staff. Um, but, you know, it's a bit of a train the trainer thing happening in the exams office. So that's how we sort of went forward with that. I'm happy to share the the guides and things that we've developed for um, uh, staff and students um, around this as well. If people are interested, I did stick my email address into the chat. Oh, thank you, Matt, because if people have asked, could you share that? Also, Taja, um, people are struggling to get through to the Tesla project. Um, would you be able to put a link into the chat? And maybe... Um, 
perhaps you could explain about the tools, some of the tools, because um, Alison mentioned, you know, keystroke dynamics in the gig economy. And that's one of the tools. It might be helpful for people to understand it's not just a single tool for a proctoring system. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure if I if I understood the whole question. So, so you wanted me to explain a little bit about Tesla. Did I yeah. did I get it right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I, I, I guess the link doesn't work anymore. So so uh yeah, Tesla is a kind of system that how how you say it? The those uh, recognize face recognition, voice recognition, keystroke dynamics, and plagiarism checker. Uh, it's possible to integrate those systems to the together, and it's it's it works. For example, you can integrate the Tesla system, for example, to the Moodle. So it just goes behind the the how you say Moodle, and and uh, there are many ways to to use it. So I'm very looking forward how the finally it will go go with us because because uh, I'm not sure how how the instruments works right now. So but but it's it means that teacher for example can choose uh, between different uh, instrument or tool. So for it, I think it's very important because, for example, when we tested it with our students using sign language, they didn't feel very comfortable to use the uh, voice, for example, for the recognition. And then they could choose the, the face recognition or keystroke dynamics. It's something, something all those, those tools are built you say inside but you can you can also add for example uh urkund plagiarism tool to that instrument or we tested it with the urkund and maybe you can turn it in also goes together i i guess uh what else to say and it it's not um not uh how is it recording all the the session or all the the exams it just tested the the uh, occasionally what is going on for example with the video and and it's it's something that the the uh how we say students were very worried about their personal data who can see it or who cannot and so on so so it's a system that that uh the, if everything is okay, if the you have a sorry, this is very very uh, difficult to explain. So you have to first of all, you have a kind of enrollment. You give a sample of your voice and your face and your keystroke dynamics. And when it comes to the the assignment or exam, it compares the the original data enrollment data to the the one data the system is collecting during the the exam does it make any sense <laughs> so so uh and and if if there is nothing wrong or nothing to worry about nobody sees your face or or sees your what you are doing but in case of some uh issues teacher can see the face and so on so and it's it's um uh, the the personal data is locally how you say locally shared or how you say so it's it's not going to to out of your institution that's the way i suppose it will work and and you can use it as a as a part of the summative assessment or formative assessment or so on thank you taja so using the tesla system you've got more than one tool that you can use in different circumstances also we had a group of lawyers as well from the Moor working on this project to make sure that where the data was stored, that the uh, users were protected with their data, and also they were um, implemental in the um, uh, usage that you sign 
that you want to use the system and that everyone would be protected in this way. So a lot of work went into that. Now, before we close, because we're very near to closing, it's it's upon me, before I thank everyone, to to sort of give a summary of, of where I think we are from our learned speakers and their opinions. So what can we say? We were all forced to move online and to do examinations online. And, um, you know, EdTech is really in the forefront. It's come together, been forced on everyone, which is really interesting. And how people responded to that, of course, has to meet the resources that are available at the time in the university and also to we haven't actually mentioned this explicitly, but in, in the answers, you could hear today how the student is first. Student is at the center. And we're not trying to do anything to um, upset any sort of examination system where, you know, what they do and how they can tell us about what they know is actually done in a fair way. So what about online proctoring? Well, as Matt said, do it yourself. <laughs> Don't go outside. But there's a lot to learn about online proctoring, how we can do this and the best way of doing it. And a test and learn is probably a good way forward before you plunge into, you know, whole scale proctoring. But um, is contract cheating the next normal? Well, we need to authenticate, don't we? And we need to have this trust. And most students don't cheat. We know that. But there is a question there that we've hinted at in an answer, and that is about the type of assessments we give our students. And Alison hit upon, you know, are our students ready for work? What is authentic assessment? And we didn't talk about assessment literacy. That is in the literature now, you know. And so what we're saying there is, do the students really understand what knowledge they should be demonstrating for the questions we're asking them? Do they really understand the questions and, and what's required of them? And I think at the heart of all our discussion, which is so encouraging, is, you know, as assessment specialists, we're here to help the student demonstrate what they have learned and what they do know. And that is our research agenda going forward, I think. I would like to thank all our speakers, Taja, Matt, Alison and Marco, for a very interesting discussion and how they built upon each other's answers and had their own take on these very important questions. So thank you to our speakers. And perhaps we can, I'm not sure we can take our microphones off, but I think we can give a clap. <laughs> thank you very much. But thank you to you in the audience for your, um, your interesting questions. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about this for a long time. Thank you to you all. And I wish you all a very good evening and goodbye.